All right, guys, you made it to the end of this emergency online edition of Botany 111. This is the last module for the last day of class. And I was hoping to make this into a little bit of a fun lecture, at least for me and hopefully for you. And I want to think about uh, this idea of plant behavior and whether or not plants have behavior. And this has sort of come up already in the class. And then for the reading, I, I wanted you to, there's these boxes that sort of compare uh, throughout the textbook to compare how plants and animals do things differently. And so hopefully in reading these, you got a sense of how plants and animals actually have to solve uh, the same basic problems, right? So to answer the question, we really need to start by asking, what is behavior? The weird thing is that um, we have whole classes and textbooks devoted to uh, behavior, but they almost always have the word animal in front of it, sort of implying that um, behavior is something that animals do, but they never really tell you what uh, behavior actually is beyond that. And so here is um, the animal behavior textbook that I used when I was an undergraduate. Um, it's still in, in print. It's obviously I didn't use the most recent edition, but um, maybe to get a feel for whether or not plants have behavior, we could take a look at this. And I think Noelle showed you this in the lab already, right? But we can take a look at the table of contents of this book, right? So if we start going down the list of things, in fact, it turns out that plants actually can recognize kin and respond differently to kin, um, which is kind of amazing. Um, it turns out that plants are able to communicate, as we've seen with uh, wasps frequently, to come and protect them from herbivores. Uh, the plants have many uh, strategies. Even though they're sessile, they have strategies for avoiding predation, and also we'll see that they have strategies for finding food. Um, we saw in the dispersal lectures that plants have all kinds of different uh, adaptations for habitat selection, right? Sometimes they trick animals into moving their seeds around. Other times they... Uh, have wings and things, or they can float on the ocean like a coconut and disperse everywhere in the world. Um, we haven't talked that much in my section, but plants have um, pretty interesting re reproductive behavior and even mating systems. Plants can potentially select when multiple males arrive on a flower, the pollen of multiple males. There's actually an element of make choice that plants can have. Plants sort of have parental care, depending on how you want to think about this. Obviously, it's nothing as sophisticated as uh, what a bird does or what a human does, but you could think of the provisioning of a seed with the things like an endosperm and the certain chemicals that plants might uh, put in a seed as a form of parental care. Um, skip chapter 10. Uh, we could talk about the development of these things, right? So the way that plants grow and express plasticity is very much um, the development of behavior. Um, plants don't really have nervous systems, so we can cross that one off. Um, so if nervous systems are required for behavior, then plants don't have behavior. But um, I think as we'll see in this lecture that that's probably not necessary. So they don't have neurons, but plants do have hormones that they use to organize behavior. And we haven't talked that much about hormones in this class, but uh, in some of the upper level botany classes, you'll have a chance to think more about this. So given that plants can do almost everything that this textbook talks about except for have a nervous system, um, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that plants have behavior. So the definition I like to use of behavior is the ability to assess and respond to stimuli in the environment. And you don't have to be an animal to do that, even though, like I said, most of the textbooks and most of the classes, and in fact, even most of the, the societies and the meetings put the word animal in front of it. You don't actually have to have that word there. Um, and so if this is the definition that we're gonna use, then, then plasticity is behavior. So if we want to think about uh, plant altruism, we need to think a little bit about how plants compete. So these are going to be some review slides, right? We, we learned that trees grow differently in the presence of competitors, right? We saw that in the lab, and we talked about this in the competition lecture. And you can see this for yourself, right? If you go out to a city park, you'll see a tree that looks an awful lot like this. Whereas if you were to cut down every tree in the forest except for one, you're going to see something like Emily Carr saw in these paintings she made of clear cuts. Um, clear-cut forests, right? And, and we saw that the way that plants do this is probably through red, far red light, right? So here's this really cool experiment that you've seen before where lots and lots of plants were grown in tight uh, competition, so they were shading each other. And then some of the plants were controlled, so they were the same height. Some were lowered and some were lifted. And what the experimenters found is that all the plants grew to basically an even height. The ones that were lowered in the triangles grew the tallest. The ones that were lifted with the squares grew the least. Um, and we also learned that you can trick into a plant into this sort of competition response in the lab, right? I don't think it worked very well for your lab, 
But in my research, I've, I think we use the lightest amount of red filtering for your lab, but you can filter more and more red light. So if you compare the most extreme filters that I have in my lab to a clear one, um, you can clearly trick plants into this competition response by taking red light away from them. So we've seen how plants sort of respond by over allocating to height and to leaf production in order to basically shade their competitors. And we saw that plants do this below ground too, right? So here is this experiment where plants were either sharing a pot, uh, fence sitters, or they were alone in pots uh, below ground, but still shading each other above ground. Um, and again, plants um, almost double their root production in the presence of a neighbor, again, trying to hurt their neighbor. So we've seen that game theory predicts this over allocation of, to tissues when plants compete. They should get taller, they should make more leaves to create more shade, and they should make more roots to steal nutrients. And this maximizes competitive ability. So all of these slides so far were review, but what if the competitor is your sibling? Right, so we know that evolution is about actually passing on genes to subsequent generations. And on average, a pair of siblings are going to have about 50% of the same genes. Um, and so if it's about passing on genes, things that you do to help your siblings might end up in, uh, by, might end up meaning that some of your genes get passed on, even if you don't have um, reproduction yourself. So this led evolutionary biologists to the idea of kin selection, which really does require genetics. It's the natural selection in favor of a behavior. This is a definition I found on the internet. Notice they have the word behavior in there. By individuals who may decrease their chance of survival, but increase the survival of their kin because of the shared genes. And this gives rise to an idea called inclusive fitness. This is the survival and reproduction of genes that take into account the fact that your genes might be in your body, but they might also be in your close relatives' bodies. So here is a study that, uh, one of the earliest studies I know of that actually showed that plants were capable of recognizing kin and that they behaved in a manner that was consistent with uh, kin selection. So this is a work by Susan Dudley and her uh, student Amanda File. So this is, this is Susan Dudley here. Um, Susan Dudley is one of those scientists when, that when she sticks her teeth into a problem, she comes at it from every angle and really works out sort of every possibility. She's uh, one of those scientists that I uh, really respect. And so what she did was she grew this plant, American Sea Rocket. It's a type of mustard. She grew it uh, either with kin, so with its siblings, or with unrelated individuals. And what they looked was the amount of roots, this funny root game that we're talking about. And then they compared those things when they're alone. So what they found was that obviously when plants were alone, they um, made fewer roots than when they were with a neighbor. So they did that game theoretic response trying to hurt neighbors, but they actually slightly reduced their roots in the presence of kin. So not only could they recognize that the kin was there, they were able to uh, reduce their reproduction um, as a result, which is Really cool, and um, so this is controversial, obviously, but uh, I think Susan Dudley's done a ton of work to address almost every criticism from almost every angle, in my opinion. So how do plants recognize neighbors and kin? The best evidence we have right now, and it's not completely understood, is that plant root exudates are involved. So plant roots are always spitting out all kinds of different chemicals. That's what these little different squiggles are supposed to represent. Um, and these chemicals do all kinds of different things in the soil. And so this is work by Marina Simchenko and her students. Um, this is Marina Simchenko here, another one of those scientists who I think does incredible, incredible research. Her experiments are always clever and extraordinarily well thought out. Um, uh, Marina and her students looked at um, the amount of root production in a patch where they took these exudates and sort of injected them into the soil and then injected water as a control. And what they found was that if you did this with different species, the plants didn't respond any different than if you just put water. But if you did it with uh, exudates of the same species and the same community, um, then the plants would do this response. And it, they didn't actually look at relatedness, but you would think that you would have more, you'd be more likely to have siblings in the same community. And when they compared that, what the uh, plants did to plants grown um, far away from a different community, potentially unrelated ones, they, they responded as if they were responding to a different species. So really cool experiment. That's the best evidence we have right now. So if we go down the list here, we've just seen evidence for something like altruism, uh, plants doing this kin selection thing to help out siblings more than unrelated individuals, and that this is arguably a form of social behavior. What about communication? 
Well, we've already seen evidence of how plants can communicate. Right? So the plant gets damaged. It reduces some volatile compound that you can often smell. So break a mint leaf and you'll be able to smell those kinds of compounds. And that this actually can attract parasitoid wasps who come and protect the plant. Really cool behavior. And we saw also that plants can do this below ground. They can actually attract, um, so we were showing here that there is some extra um, compound and that they were able to actually attract these nematodes to come and protect their roots so they can do it below ground. What's cool about this though in terms of a communication perspective is plants can actually eavesdrop on each other. So you can imagine if a plant is, is releasing volatile cues to attract a parasitoid wasp, right? If your neighbor's doing that and they're being attacked but you haven't been attacked yet, it would be useful if you could eavesdrop on that signal and start protecting yourself before you're even attacked. And in fact, plants do this. So here is another chemical that can defend plants on the y-axis. And what you're looking at is plants. These are tobacco plants grown near a completely different species, uh, sagebrush. And what they did was they clipped the sagebrush or put herbivores on the sagebrush or did nothing to the sagebrush. And what you're looking at here is the response in the tobacco, not in the sagebrush. So the tobacco is listening to the volatiles coming from damaged sagebrush, and it's turning on this chemical that protects it from herbivores. And in fact, you can see that... that um, Basically, whenever they were near the clipped plants, if the, if the sagebrush was damaged, the plants turned on this chemical and it reduced how much damage they took from their herbivores. And um, this was a, a function of how far away the plants were. So if the sagebrush was close, you could see that clipped plants have almost half the damage of unclipped plants. And again, this is not, this is not the, the tobacco plant that was clipped. This was its neighbor that was clipped. So when it's near a clipped plant, it protects itself and it gets less damage and that this signal goes away the further you are. So the plants are clearly eavesdropping in on each other. Uh, Richard Carbon has done a lot of work on this. It's, it's really cool. Again, he's one of those scientists that digs his teeth into a problem and uh, doesn't let it go. So he's come at this question. This is, I think, one of his earliest papers on the topic, but he's come at this from, again, just a number of really different and exciting directions and really figured out how the system works. So as we work our way down the list, right, we see some evidence for uh, kin selection, this sort of altruistic behavior towards closely related individuals that is arguably a form of social behavior. We've seen that plants can communicate with invertebrates and that they can eavesdrop on each other's communications well, and that they do this as a form of avoiding predators. What about finding food, right? We've talked a bit about this too. Um, well, plants are actually really good at finding food. As you, would, as you might think, right? But plant food is carbon dioxide and it's mineral nutrients, as you've seen. There's a major difference there between plants and animals. And so again, we're gonna do this sort of meta YouTube video inside a YouTube video. Um, what you can do is you can watch a sunflower tracking the sun in slow, uh, in time-lapse photography. So you've got the sun rising on this side and setting on this side. So what you can see is the plant is tracking the sun as it moves. And it's doing this by elongating cells on different sides of its body. Nighttime comes, it loses turgor pressure. But you can see that before the sun has even risen, it's anticipated that it's going to rise in the east. And there it goes. It can start it over again. Really cool. Um, not surprisingly, plants can do similar things below ground. So um, in this experiment by Cahal et al., um, they looked at how do plants put their roots through soil, uh, whether when they're alone or when they're with neighbors. So we've got sort of foraging and competition interacting here. And what they found was, so you're basically looking at uh, a, a picture of what the pot looked like. And so this is how, this is distance away from the stem in centimeters. Um, and you can see that when a plant is alone, it fills the pot. So this is the average distance they went, about 11 and a half centimeters. And here you're looking at the probability of finding uh, a root at that location. So you can see that it's roughly 50-50 chance of finding a root at any of these locations. But when you add a neighbor, um, the plants only go, you know, five and a half centimeters away from the stem. They almost perfectly avoid each other. So it changes where they grow in the soil. Um, when they put a patch in between, you can see that it does change not so much the distance, but the probability of finding a root. Now it's much closer to you know 80 or 90% chance of finding a root 
close to the patch and it drops off as you get far and then now the plants are much more willing to overlap with their neighbor and compete and if you put the patch on the other side of the red plant um, you can see that this blue guy gets pushed back even further so the the red plant it, they don't show it but the red plant puts all its roots on this side um, and yeah so plants are really good at uh, arranging their leaves in ways that maximize the light and the photosynthesis uh, that they're doing. They're also really good at arranging their root systems and soil to maximize their ability to gather nutrients. They can potentially avoid competitors when the soil is bad, confront them when the soil is good, um, and completely change the distribution of their roots to match the distribution of resources in the soil. Again, highly plastic form of what I would argue is behavior. Um, and so if we think about the ways that plant foraging behavior differ, there's actually quite a few ways that makes it kind of interesting. And, one of the, I wanna, and I wanna talk about those. Currency, the mechanism, uh, the fact that plants have modular growth, and the fact that there's a positive feedback in this modularity. So if we think about the currency, um, right, animals, and this was in one of the boxes that you read for your uh, reading, Animals forage for food packets that contain mixtures of molecules and elements. Your textbook basically says that animals eat protoplasm. Um, right, so a zebra has all kinds of mineral nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus that lions need. Um, the problem though is that if you're a, a lion, you have, to, you have to eat a zebra. You can't just go and eat some phosphorus. It doesn't work like that for an animal. But plants forage for molecules and elements individually, right? So a plant can actually decide, I need more sulfur, and I can make more of the uptake proteins that bring in a specific uh, element, and it's able to do that. So it can say, I need more nitrogen, so I can make more uptake proteins for nitrogen. I need more sulfur in this picture, I can make more uptake proteins for uh, sulfur. So the currency is really different, right? You can imagine that the math you would need to think about foraging of a lion on something like a zebra is really different than how you would deal with the individual uptake of all these different molecules in a plant. The mechanism is also really different, right? So animals generally forage by, they have one mouth and they move it around the landscape, right? So here is uh, the movement of four different coyotes in Chicago, actually. Downtown Chicago is right here. Um, so you can see these four coyotes, I don't remember the time period. Uh, it's probably around a year or a couple months. But you can see these four coyotes are moving all through Chicago in very defined areas. They're kind of using the, the parks, these empty parks, to, to forage and move around. But you, to track the foraging behavior of a coyote, you have to put a GPS collar on it and do like these guys did and sort of figure out where it's hanging out most of the time. Um, but plants forage by growing tissues, right? They make many mouths. And they put them all over the place, right? There's a, and there's also a division of labor above and below ground. They can make more leaves, as you've seen in the game I've been forcing you to play, uh, if they need carbon. And they can make more roots if they need things like nitrogen. So here's that, that picture again. Um, what's cool, though, is that, the, like we saw in that Cahill paper, that the roots almost leave a permanent... Um, record of the plant's foraging decisions, right? In the same way that this map shows you all of the sort of foraging decisions that this coyote made as it moved through the Chicago's park systems. Um, you have to track that in real time, right? You need some kind of GPS collar, but with a plant, you can actually see everywhere it went because its roots remain connected. Um, it's actually way easier to study animal foraging from that respect. Um, you know, animals generally only have one mouth. They can't make more. The textbook talks about the fact that, um, you know, you were born with the heart and the lungs and the kidney and the ribs that you have now. But a plant remakes its entire vascular system every year. Um, and animals can only be in one place at a time. Right, so if, if we're thinking of this sort of metaphorical idea of foraging, plants can make many mouths and they can put them all over the place. So a plant loses a leaf, it can, make, it, can, it can make a new one. If a plant finds itself in a really good place and it wants lots of leaves, that's fine, it can make more leaves. Right? A squirrel that you put in a bowl full of peanuts can't grow a bunch of extra mouths to, to eat the peanuts faster. It just doesn't work that way. So plants can be many places at the same time and damage to one part of a plant isn't as big a deal for, for it is, as it is for an animal. Um, and then this leads to a sort of positive feedback loop, right? So most animals that are successful foragers can sort of linearly increase their fitness kind of to a limit, right? You eat more food, you can maybe survive the winter, storing uh, energy as fat, like the textbook talked about. But there's really a limit, you know, you can't um, have thousands of babies, uh, well, if you're a mammal anyway. I guess some invertebrates can. Um, 
right? But the, the key is that you could starve a squirrel and it would have fewer babies than a well-fed squirrel. Um, but a well-fed squirrel is never going to have more than six or seven babies, no matter how well you feed it. Um, it's just not possible to have six or seven babies. Um, you know, a squirrel's not going to grow to the size of an elephant and have a thousand babies. It just can't do that. But plants that are successful foragers can do that. They can ex exponentially increase their fitness, right? Successful foragers grow larger, get more foraging capacity that lets them grow larger again, and so on in a sort of positive feedback loop. And they can have more and more offspring. I have an Eastern red bud in my backyard that is five years old. It's flowering for the first time and it made probably two dozen flowers. Um, so, you know, it's gonna have a couple dozen fruit this year with maybe a couple dozen seeds per fruit. Um, but the eastern red bud that's flowering in my neighbor's yard has thousands of flowers, uh, you know, and it's probably 10 or 20 years old. And so, um, yeah, that exponential increase in fitness as a plant gets more and more successful through time is something that's really different. You could almost imagine that colonial animals are a bit more like plants in this respect, or maybe the other way around, right? Successful colonies are able to make more mouths, workers. Uh, who then work for the fitness of the whole colony, right? So here's a paper that I wrote a long time ago where we actually compared all this stuff I'm telling you to be a little bit like uh, a bee um, colony in that the individual workers don't reproduce, right? They, they fan out across the landscape gathering resources and bringing it back to this central location, a little bit like the root system of a plant. So if we go back to the textbook, yeah, plants um, can actively find food. And so I think I'm going to leave it here for the time being. This was only meant to be a little bit of fun, not to be uh, a tirade about all the different things that plants have. But hopefully it's clear to you that plants can do a lot of complicated and interesting things. And when they can't, they're the fact that they're sessile, rooted in place, um, means that they often just recruit animals to help them. Um, with uh, habitat selection, right? With migration, animals can move seeds over massive distances. Um, with reproductive behavior and their mating systems, um, and so on. And so, yeah, hopefully I've convinced you that plants can have behavior, or at least that animal people should define behavior in a way that excludes plants if they don't think plants have behavior. Um, although personally, I just use the word plasticity because it provokes fewer arguments. So this lecture was mostly review. There's not that much new here. I'd like you to know the definition of behavior. Um, and then is it different from the definition of plasticity? Um, I would argue that it's not. And then maybe a little bit about how you would uh, persuade someone. So what evidence did we talk about? What have we learned in this class that would help you persuade someone at an animal behavior society meeting that you belong at that meeting as a botany student? You should know the definition of kin selection and inclusive fitness. Those are some uh, classic evolutionary biology ideas that you should know. And then maybe the four ways that plants differ in their foraging behavior from animals. And the rest of this lecture was mostly slides that you'd seen before. So really, I want you to be able to think about this argument and how I constructed this argument, you know, how I used evidence to draw conclusions and uh, definitions as well. Okay, guys, so that is the end of this emergency online part of the class. I really want to thank you for sticking with me um, this far. Um, yeah, it's been a learning experience for all of us, I think, but I think you guys have been hanging in there pretty well. I'm, I'm proud of you all. And, you know, one of the things that, that I think I'm most upset about by having to go online with this is that I don't actually get to really meet any of you. So I would really, I, if you liked anything that I had to say, or you know, particularly if you're one of the botany uh, majors or uh, minors, um, you know, whenever this is all over, uh, walk by my office and introduce yourself someday, please. You know, it would be, be nice. Usually, I really like to get to know all the freshman students interested in plant biology. And I'm really sad that I didn't get to do that this year. So seriously, come by my office whenever the school opens up again and introduce yourself. I'd, I'd really like to be able to put names to faces. Um, all right, well, good luck on the exam, guys. Uh, yeah, and thanks for hanging in there.